ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. The Drive. Elmore deep, left side three, and good! From 30 feet, John Elmore! The Drive with Paul Swan. Welcome in. It is the Friday edition, April 12th. The Drive begins now. ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan. Thanks for joining me for today's edition of the program. Of course, it's Friday. That means we can talk a little bit more about the Stanley Cup playoffs. We'll do that later on in the program. It's been fun so far, really. I've been in really intrigued i think with this year's edition if you haven't watched any just yet you've got plenty of opportunity again it's the best playoff period it's better than the nba playoffs it's better than the major league baseball playoffs it's definitely better than soccer playoffs it's right there i mean okay i would argue that maybe football is one and one a with the hockey playoffs but you're never going to convince me that anything comes close other than maybe football to just the intensity of a potentially seven-game series between two hockey teams playing for the oldest trophy in North America. That's how I feel about that. So we're going to get into that later on. Uh, we got a lot to get into today. Though. Some st- some sad stuff, really. So I guess that's where I'm going to begin. If you're a longtime Bengals fan, you know the name of Forrest Gregg. You know he's the coach that led the Bengals to the Super Bowl early on in the uh, Bengals' history, and he passed away. Now, I didn't know Forrest Gregg as far as his playing days, a little little bit before my time. Predates me, but he was the head coach of the Bengals from 80 to 83 and led them to their first Super Bowl in the 81 season. I do remember the 81 season. I was a youngster, but I do remember at least shades of that season. He went 32-25 and in his four seasons with the Bengals, also uh, led them to the playoffs in the strike-shortened 1982 season. Mike Brown, president of the Bengals, who has known him probably for a majority of uh, his life, issued a statement today, said that it's a sad day here. My memories of Force are very special. He not only was the coach of the team, but we were also good friends. As a coach, he was very successful here. We had good people, good players, and he got the best out of them. He was demanding. The players didn't try to cut corners. They went out and did what they had to do, and what we were doing worked. We were somewhat ahead of the curve at the time. It saddens me greatly that he's gone, and I express sympathy to Barbara and his children. Now, no details just yet on his passing, um, but still, if you're a Bengals fan, you, you know the name. You, uh, you remember his days in the NFL. He began his career in 1956. He played uh, his final season with the Cowboys in 71. Then he started coaching in the NFL, played on six NFL NFC championship teams and three Super Bowl winners. Uh, He was elected to the NFL's all-decade team of the 60s and its 75th anniversary team. Also coached Cleveland and Green Bay. Vince Lombardi had lots of praise for him back in the day. One of the uh, the best ever. And you don't see guys like this anymore. You really don't. He had a successful career in the NFL, went on the coaching, had a successful career by anybody's standard. Now, we're not measuring by the Bill Belichick standard of success with his multiple Super Bowl wins. We're not doing that. That's a, that's a different standard, different day. But he was um, really, if you're a Bengals fan, you know the name. If you're not a Bengals fan, maybe you still know the name. Packers, Cowboys, you know the name. But he uh, passes away today at the age of 85. So sad day if you're a Bengals fan. And then maybe this name doesn't have much impact for you, but it's still pretty sad. Another Bengal passes away, this time Frank Smoos. He's an original member of the Bengals coaching staff, longtime scout. He passed away at age 95. So another longtime Bengal passing away. And he was a linebacker's coach in 1968. Again, predates me. Then he moved into a full-time scouting role. He finished his full-time scouting status in 1995. But he was part of the team. He was active. And he was there for draft preparations up until 2000. So he was a part of the team for a long time. And then Mike Brown issued this statement uh, following up on that today. Frank was a top-notch guy who was well-respected by everyone. Uh, He was with us a long time, he said it. But Frank also said he grew to love the guy. He could call him and they could talk about anything, he said. Mainly they talked football in the statement. But Brown said everything around this business he was conversant with and we would talk about all that i will miss him and his friendship so 
Of course, his legacy is uh, right now being honored on Bengals.com, so I would direct you there. But if you're a Bengals fan, a couple of, of longtime older names uh, departing, and you don't remember these guys as well as you should. And here's a guy who was a coach in 1968. You're not going to know the name. Now, if you're talking about Forrest Gregg, you're going to know the name a little bit more because of his previous playing days and, of course, his coaching of the Bengals, get the Bengals to their first ever Super Bowl. So you're going to know the name. I mean, he's not out of our, well, out of our memory. Our short-term memory, yes, our long-term memory. If you're a Bengals fan, you know the details. Even if you weren't around, if you're a Bengals fan, you, you know a little bit of the history. Now, I don't expect Bengals fans to be able to name every single player and coach that ever was part of the organization, but if you're going to know a name from the past, you're going to know Forrest Gregg, and if you don't, uh, definitely uh, a sad loss. So he passes away, and you hope that the Bengals can find a way to honor these guys. I remember a couple of years ago, I was up uh, Cincinnati for a game, and they brought some of the older guys out. Now, granted, it was just a wet, nasty day. Fans, not that many there, but there were some guys, some older guys, like, hey, yelling, hey, you know, can you guys play? I think the I think the Bengals were playing the Eagles. I think that's the game I went to, just uh, just not to get sidetracked here, but I think they were playing the Eagles. And I can remember uh, they were honoring, because it was part of the Bengals' 50th anniversary, so they were bringing guys back, honoring guys, and as they should, which I thought was a great gesture to remember these guys. I mean, you don't have the long-standing history of the Cincinnati Reds, but 50 years, that's pretty good. In this day and age, franchises move, come and go. I don't know how long that Cincinnati will remain in the NFL if one day a different ownership group would get a hold of the team or the family would just say, look, we're done, this, this is going somewhere else. I don't know if that day would ever come, but... Make it 50 years, that's pretty cool. It really is, and they're beyond that now, and... They haven't had the the huge impact in the NFL with Hall of Fame players, Super Bowl wins. They're, however, I think as many smaller market teams are, I mean, they're a vibrant part of of the fabric of your community and the NFL. You know, I think that small teams are sometimes more fun. These smaller markets. Not everybody can be the Dallas Cowboys. We're going to continue with today's edition of The Drive. We'll take your phone calls coming up here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. You're listening to The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. It's the Friday, April 12th edition. Paul Swan, your host for today's edition of The Drive on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Stanley Cup playoffs continue. NBA is going to start ramping up soon, so we'll have that to talk about next week. And we come back on Monday, going to actually be at the Union Pub and Grill, believe it or not. We don't have baseball in the way. Baseball airtime tonight, 640, our regular time. You can catch all the Pirates games all season long right here on our family of Kindred Communication Stations. Of course, primarily right here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. But the uh, Capitals open up their Stanley Cup defense. They get a win. Uh, the Lightning are going to try to avoid that 2 nothing deficit. You know, the Capitals, they're actually playing a little bit like the champs. They had lost game one and four of their previous five postseason series, and they got off to a good start yesterday. And they had to hold on, though, but they beat the Hurricanes. Nicholas Backstrom had two goals in that game to give him 100 career postseason points, becoming the second player in Capitals history. To reach that mark, you know, the first guy is Alex Ovechkin. That guy is eventually going to be so close to breaking some serious records, including Wayne Gretzky's record. I think if anyone can do it in this current crop, that's the first guy that's going to come to it. And you want to talk about Ovechkin, scored a power play goal in the victory. That's his 22nd career power play goal in the playoffs. Third most among active players. The only guys who have more, Evgeny Malkin, Patrick Marlowe, have more. Also, Ovechkin's 62nd career postseason goal. He's tied now with Bobby Hall. Bobby Hall for 27th most all time. That's a name right there. So he's going up the charts. Other action, Maple Leafs beat the Bruins for what? I, I have fun watching these games, but at the same time, I was hoping for a little bit more of a contested contest. I got that with the Capitals game. But the Maple Leafs take game one against the Bruins. That's a five-game losing streak that they snapped in season. I'm sorry, series openers. 
It was their first Game 1 win since, believe it or not, the 2003 Conference Quarterfinals, and that was at Philadelphia. That's been a while. Flames, I've got them as one of my picks to go to the Stanley Cup. The Flames beat the Avalanche 4 nothing, and that's the first shutout this year in the playoffs, and the Flames get it. So they beat Avalanche 4 nothing. First postseason win for Calgary since May 5th, 2015 against Anaheim. So they're snapping a six-game losing streak in the postseason. Mike Smith was pretty good. He had 26 saves in his first postseason game since May 22nd of 2012. He was with the Coyotes that year. It was his fourth career uh, win in the postseason, first since May 20th, 2012. So we got games. We got so many games tonight. Now, one thing you know about the playoffs, if you get down 2 nothing, you're in a pretty nasty hole. And teams that win the first two games of a best-of-seven series own an all-time series record of 318-50. and 50. That is 86.4%. Yeah, I brought the numbers today, didn't I? Including a 241-30 and 30 mark when those victories come at home, which is 88.9%. And a 72-20 and 20 record when they come on the road at 78.3%. Note, five best-of-seven series started 2 nothing with games one and two split between cities. So you've got the Blue Jackets at the Lightning tonight trying to uh, continue their success. The team that we've all picked to win it, Tampa Bay, the Lightning, blew a three-goal lead in the playoffs for the first time in franchise history. They're trying to bounce back. Tampa Bay lost consecutive games only twice this season. They fell in regulation to the Senators and the Sabres back, and that was around November 10th, the 13th, and then consecutive defeats against the Golden Knights. That was in a shootout, and overtime against the Blues from February 5th, the 7th. And you know only three President's Trophy winners have lost their first two games of a postseason. Two of the three went on to lose the series. But the 2012 Red Wings not only won the series, but the Stanley Cup. You remember, best team Russian money could buy? The Stanley Cup, Red Wings, they were pretty good. President Trophy winner since the 85-86 season. 2012 Canucks, series result, lost. 2009 Sharks, lost. 2002 Red Wings, won, went on to the Stanley Cup. And you know a team that I was kind of not sure how far I should put them in my bracket? St. Louis Blues. They're looking to start with a 2 nothing lead for the second straight year. They led the Capitals 2 nothing last year, but they went on and lost in six games. So don't forget about the Blue Jackets. Don't forget about what they're pay- they're capable of doing. I think they're going to be tough. I think they're going to be tough. I, I just didn't know where to put them. I, I really thought, okay, Tampa Bay, I think they're going to win this whole thing, but you, know, you can't count them out just yet. You can't count them out. Penguins and Islanders. This is going to be the fun series, I think. Islanders lead it one nothing, and the Penguins are trying to avoid that 2 nothing hole for the first time since the 2013 Conference Finals against the Bruins. They were swept. The Islanders are looking for their first 2-0 series lead since the 1983 Stanley Cup Final. They swept that series. New York is 11-1 all-time when leading 2-0 in a best-of-seven series. They've won 10 straight. And believe it or not, Sidney Crosby held without a point in Game 1. He hasn't been held without a point in a consecutive playoff game since the 2017 Conference Finals against the Senators. He's played 24 playoff games since. Oshie was a little colder when I was facing him in fantasy hockey, but held without a point in game one. We'll see if that turns around in game two. Now the Blues, St. Louis Blues, they're looking for their first 2-0 series lead since the 2017 first round against Minnesota. St. Louis won that series in five games but lost the previous two times. They took a 2-0 series lead. That was the 2013 conference quarterfinals against the Kings and 2014 first round against the Blackhawks. So the Blues taking on the Jets tonight. It's going to be the later game, 9.30 p.m. Penguins Islanders, 7.30 p.m. tonight. Blue Jackets at Lightning going to be 7 o'clock tonight. The Blues, that was another one of those teams. I just looked at them and thought, okay, they're pretty hot right now. If any team can maybe make a run, mess up your day, if you're bracketing this thing, it could be the Blues. The Jets, however, looking to snap a five-game postseason losing streak going all the way back to the 2018 Conference Finals. They went on to be swept in each of the two previous instances that they fell behind 2-0 in a series. Back in 2007, Conference Quarters versus the Rangers and 2015 first round against the Ducks. And then, if you're going to be diehard, you're going to stay up late tonight. 10.30 p.m., you get the Golden Knights and the Sharks. Sharks lead that series 1-0. 
the Golden Knights have lost five straight playoff games. You know where we're going back to, of course. You know what I'm talking about, Stanley Cup last year, all the way back to the 2018 Stanley Cup final. Yeah, it was so long ago, right? They went 13-3 and in the playoffs prior to that stretch. Marc-Andre Fleury, he was the guy you rode last year to the final. Uh, he allowed four goals in Game 1, the third straight playoff game in which he's allowed four-plus goals dating back to last year's Cup Final. I don't know how much he's got in him. I mean, he was a big instrumental part of Vegas' success last year. He was huge. I just don't know how much is left in the tank for him. But four goals in Game 1, that matches the longest such streak of his postseason career done twice previously, uh, last time 2013 Conference Quarterfinals against the Islanders. Now, the Sharks are trying to uh, start the postseason with a 2 nothing lead for the second straight year. They led the Ducks 2 nothing last year, and then they went on a sweep. So there you go. All the hockey. All the hockey. Yeah, you knew we were talking about it. We'll, we'll break down the NBA like this on Monday. Fair? I think that's fair. We'll do that. We'll bust it all out on Monday. We'll break down what happened in the NBA like this as well. But Stanley Cup playoffs, you know, I'm going to be excited watching all of that this weekend. Now, thankfully, I'm not going to be sitting at the TV watching. I'm not going to have four screens because I could do that this year. Again, they're they're spreading it out. They've gotten wise. NBC has all these properties. So USA Network showing games. you got NBC Sports Network. Uh, then the NBA is going to be on all your TV screens. It's a good time, isn't it? You, next couple of weeks, it's going to be fun. It's sort of it's spread out a little bit more. That's why I like it, unlike, say, March Madness, where March Madness is all condensed. That's the beauty of that. First couple of days, it's high noon. Here we go. We're going to have basketball noon to midnight. You can do that like a Thursday, Friday. Work productivity, at least Thursday, maybe Friday just goes out the window. We're all sitting here watching the stream. And you couldn't do this years ago. I've told you this before. When they started streaming these games, when that was a thing, to actually stream the games, you had to sign up. It's not like today where you just either, if you've got it on a provider, because if you have CBS All Access, you can just pop that app opening. There you go. But you had to sign up. You had to sign up, and then they would le- let you know. They would email you, okay, you can log in. I mean, I'm going back a ways here. I'm talking about 10, maybe 10, 12 years ago. It's not that far, but far enough. Let's put it this way. I was in a different office working, and I'm not talking the company, different office, different company when I was doing that. And it was always fun. Again, I've told you the story, the boss button. You hit the boss button, and this fake spreadsheet comes up. Like, that was going to fool anybody. Like, Paul, what do you have a spreadsheet? I'm just organizing my notes. Yeah, see? Right here. Spreadsheet. Doing my work here at my desktop. Now, you know, we got iPhones. We got iPads. We can multitask. It's sort of like what I do when we have a road game for the Thundering Herd. I'm here. I'm multitasking. i got several screens. i got ESPN Plus up or something like that. I'm able to watch the game, follow the stats on the game tracker. Do all of that. Didn't have that so many years. It was so hard, really. The Dark Age is really a sports fandom where you had to watch it on TV or this new thing you had to sign up for, this streaming thing. And before that, and I've told you the story, I believe. Yeah, you would have to buy the package. I bought the package, Direct TV, years and years ago. You can watch the entire NCAA tournament. So I get the package. It was really inexpensive. It wasn't that much. And I would just take off work. You guys don't need me. We're going to be carrying games. I'm not going to be on the air doing the show. So I don't have to worry about that. And I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to watch the games. I had to flip the channels to find my game. Not today. No, you can you can do that over the air on CBS or on the Turner Network channels. You don't have to worry about that now. The same thing. That's what you got with hockey now with NBC. NBA is a little bit the same way. That's sort of why I like the way that they are staggering these packages. You know, I want to watch this game. Well, you can't. Well, now I can. And that's the cool thing about it. I really like that. Well, we'll continue on with today's edition of The Drive. Paul Swan, your host on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Now, back to The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Friday, April 12th edition. Paul Swan, your host for today's edition of The Drive here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Thundering Herd Baseball beginning a home series today, and uh, hopefully the weather's going to hold up. But right now, bottom of the fourth, Herd leading Western Kentucky 7-1. to one. I'll take that any day. 
baseball's got some big and bright things ahead for them. If they do well now, think of what the anticipation is going to be when that stadium opens. When they break ground, get that thing going, and then we're going to be talking about herd baseball in a home stadium. Afternoon games, get to go down, go see some herd baseball. I'm thinking about that, that's cool. It's really cool. But right now, again, seven um, one bottom of the fourth. As I look at my phone right now for the stat update, trying to keep an eye on that and run this show. It's very hard. This is um, professional level engineering going on here on the program. Paul Swan, your host here for the drive every weekday on ESPN ninety four point one FM and AM nine thirty. And baseball is in action, but hey, we got softball as well. Heard going to better weather on the road, taking on the FIU Panthers. It'll be a Saturday doubleheader beginning at 4 p.m. They've got an overall record of 25 and 13, 8 and 4 in conference. They take on a Panthers team coming in at 20 and 19 and 2 and 10 in conference play. So I like Marshall's chances. 8 and 4 in conference is pretty solid. Marshall won its fourth straight Conference USA series after beating Western Kentucky's women 10 to 2 in game 1, 8 to 7 in game 3, fell 7 and 1 in game 2 at the dot. Western Kentucky had come into the weekend in first place with a 9 nothing record in conference action, also receiving points. That's right, they got some votes in the NFCA coaches poll. So the Thundering Herd, looking pretty solid right now. Um, I'll say this. This is what I expect. This is one of the programs I expect to do this every year. Hopefully tennis is going to bounce back, but this is what I have expected from softball day one. So it looks like they are uh, getting into a great run. I mean, Megan Smith has done a fantastic job. Great start for first season. Um, Marshall's taking the first four Conference USA series. Over Charlotte, UTSA, Southern Miss, and Western Kentucky, going to two and one in each set. So that's pretty solid. And then Marshall leads a series against FIU 10 to 7. They've met 17 times. And this one, though, this one's a little older. It goes back, way back. I'm talking 1999. Were some of you even born in 1999? That's so far away. The herd played them back on March 20th of 1999, won that one, won nothing. And then they didn't play again for 15 years. Yo, that's relevant, though. Hey, you you leave the series 10 to 7. That's relevant. So FIU, as we mentioned, uh, two and 10 in conference play. They have been swept by Western Kentucky, Middle Tennessee, and North Texas. They did take two of three from Florida Atlantic. And uh, they've dropped 12 straight, including the first game of the series. So they bounced back a little bit, but I still think the herd's going to take this series. So softball action, of course, uh, you can. Um, I believe you can listen to uh, some of this action over on the student station. They're streaming the games over at marshall.edu, WMUL is the uh, listen link site, so you can check that out if you're going to follow the softball team this weekend, and uh, as you should, because, again, I've always thought that maybe tennis, tennis was there for a while. Coach Mercer's going to get them back. But softball is one of those signature sports that you just expect them every year. You want them competing. I think they're going to make the NCAA tournament uh, more times than not, or at least they're going to be consistent. They're going to get in. I think Marshall's got a better chance of getting in the NCAA tournament in softball than they do basketball, just to be fair. I know that's heresy for some, but I think it's true. They're just a consistent program, and you know, they had down years and they bounced back. I think, I think things are just going to get better and better for them. Yeah, I would be looking for some facility upgrades. So, as soon as baseball rolls in, I'd be like, hey, um, can we get a little, um, little extra attention over here at the dot? And you probably could get that as well. And facilities have helped, really. I mean, the coaching's been there. The, uh, the talent's been there. Facilities have definitely helped as far as what they've been able to do. All right, we got more on the way. It's The Drive, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. This is The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Welcome back to the Friday, April 12th edition of The Drive on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan. Don't forget, we got Pirates baseball coming up tonight. They are playing a little earlier than usual. Thank goodness they're not playing the Cubs anymore. So we're getting back to a little bit normal of a schedule. Hey, it was fine with me. I was good with it. A little late baseball. I like afternoon. 
I know, I'm probably one of the few. I like the afternoon baseball. It just feels like baseball to me. If it's being played in the afternoon, and I know nighttime baseball is where it's at, but I do like the daytime of baseball. I, I don't know if you can do that all the time, but I like, especially the games that are the weekdays, and it's a getaway game, and they got to play in the afternoon so the other team can get going and uh, get to their next destination. I'm just uh, I'm totally cool with that. But, yeah, I get it. You can't go to the game. If you're in that city, you can't go to the game if it's an afternoon game. I don't know the way attendance is. Um, does it really matter? Especially if your team's not that good. I mean, imagine you're, so you're a Cincinnati Reds fan right now. Are you – you're sitting there going, hmm, yeah, am I, am I going to invest in this? Am I going to jump in on this, wait and see? I was hopeful for a couple of days on this thing. Or am I just going to be, yeah, we'll see. Come back in a few weeks. We'll see how it goes. Don't forget the Pirates are winning. I know the Cubs are uh, a thing to be reckoned with, but the Pirates are winning. You can catch that coming up tonight right here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. So some of you will be watching hockey with me. Some of you will be watching college basketball award stuff. The Wooden Award is going to be uh, announced 8 o'clock on ESPN 2. And is it going to be Zion Williams? Zion Williams. Is it going to be him? You know, if it is him. Oh, by the way, R.J. Barrett's up for it as well. And I mentioned that because Coach K is sitting pretty. Sure, they didn't win the NCAA uh, tournament. Sure, they got knocked out before they can get to the Final Four. So, yeah, you can throw all those. Um, you can throw all that there. But if R.J. Barrett or Zion Williamson wins, Duke's going to have the honor and distinction of having a sixth Wooden Player of the Year winner. That will be the most of any school. So if you're a Kentucky fan, you're already hating this. You're hating this even more. So Duke's got five. Right now their last winner is J.J. Redick, 2005-2006 season. North Carolina's got four. Kansas has two. Believe it or not, Kansas, two. Oklahoma, two. BYU has two. Texas has two. UCLA, St. John's, Virginia, all two. Virginia, though, their last winner was Ralph Sampson. Can you believe that? That's how far we got to go back. If you're Virginia, Ralph Sampson, 1982-83. St. John's had Walter Berry. That last winner was in 85-86. Uh, UCLA, uh, wow, this goes back away. Not as not as far as Ralph Sampson, but UCLA's last winner, Ed O'Bannon, 94-95. Wow, that goes back. Texas, well, here's a name that's going to make you feel, um, well, might feel a little old. Kevin Durant back in the 2006-7 season. Yeah, I feel old there. Um, Tyler Hansborough, 2007-8 for North Carolina. Uh, Frank Mason the third for Kansas, 2016-17. Uh, for Oklahoma, Buddy Hyde, 2015-16. So if this happens and Duke gets a winner, um, well, first of all, Coach K has got two of the finalists, so that's pretty awesome for him. And this is going to be also the sixth Wooden Award winner for him. He's coached them all, and that's going to be three times as many as any other coach. But if Grant Williams wins, it would give Rick Barnes his third Wooden Award winner more than any other coach not named Coach K. Um, Tom Izzo and Matt McMahon have never coached a Wooden Award winner. So Coach K's got five. Now, how does Coach K rank with everyone else? There are some big names on this list. First of all, five's pretty good. The next is two, and that's Coach K by none other than John Calipari. Anthony Davis is the last winner. And then Rick Barnes has Kevin Durant as the last winner, so that's two there. And then uh, Louis Carnesecca with Walter Berry in 85-86 has two. So Dean Smith, his last winner, he has two. Michael Jordan. And Terry Holland has two. And his last winner, as we mentioned, with Virginia, Ralph Sampson. And the ACC also is where basketball happens already has more than twice as many Wooden Award winners as any other conference. The Big East has four. The Big Ten has five. The Big 12 has five. And the ACC has 12. 12 Wooden Award winners. I don't even see the SEC on this list. That's the thing that kind of, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at my notes. SEC, SEC, SEC. No, not on the list. That's a that's a crazy that's a crazy number right there. But you've got the Wooden Award. I think that's going to be huge, especially for Duke. I know these guys. It's it's small consolation. I mean, you want to win the individual awards, you really do. But at the end of the day, you want the championship, 
or at least you would think. I don't know. The uh, one-and-done era, uh, do these guys really care about uh, what happens in college? Is that a thing? Because I don't think they all think they're going to come in, play one year, win a national championship, go on to the NBA. And for some guys, they wouldn't even play that year if they didn't have to. Totally get that, completely understand. Just the way the marketplace is right now and the way that uh, there are restrictions, I think I would be okay with it, though, if these guys would skip college and go to the NBA. I would be okay with that. Because if they can go and they're ready to play, let them play. Simple, right? If you're ready to go and you're ready to play, go, play. Because, honestly, they're there for one thing. Now, if these kids go back later, pick up their classwork, go on their time, get a degree, I mean, that's great for them. But I honestly think there's got to be a way for kids at this level, instead of, if they're ready to go now, let's not waste their time in one year of college. Now, of course, college coaches are probably looking at me like, what are you talking about? And I think it's fair. I think it's true. These kids, if they're ready to go, should go. I mean, college basketball is not going to be, uh, I think, diminished by that. Because how many of these kids can really play? How many are we talking about here? 10? 20? 50? What are we talking about here? How many of these kids are actually going to be able to be on that level and make an impact? But how do you filter all that out? And that's the thing you got to consider is, I know we use college. It's the training ground. It really is. College is the training ground. Let's just be fair. Uh, For a lot of kids, they know that this is going to be the last stop for them. This is their last stop in college athletics or in athletics. They're going to play. They're going to finish out. And they're going to be done. Some will go on and have a nice pro career, either at the highest level, the NBA. They're going to play in lower leagues overseas. They're going to have some extension of their career. Or they're going to play a little while and then maybe get into coaching. And think about that. A lot of guys are probably playing overseas and they've got their eye on, all right, when this is over, I put myself in a good position. I've made some money. I can start maybe transitioning into being a coach. A lot of guys want to go that route. And if you're already playing at the at the professional level, I mean, your foot's maybe in the door. I don't know what opportunities are there for you, but you know we, we've heard of coaches coaching overseas and then coming back and having successful careers in the NBA. I think I know a guy. And that's going to do it for this edition of The Drive here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan. Thanks for joining me. Uh, we're going to get this thing back in order on Monday. We're going to be back at the Union Pub and Grill. It's kind of felt strange. Last couple of weeks, baseball has knocked us off the air. We haven't had the show on Monday. Looking forward to going back and hanging out with Herb Stanley and the gang. Monday special, $1.50 bottles, $2 call shots. And, of course, he'll have the TVs ready to roll. If you want to watch the NBA, you want to watch the NHL, you want to watch all of that, well, he'll find it on the TV for you and put it on for you. And that's going to be Monday from the Union Pub and Grill. And that's going to do it for this edition. Once again, my host's name is Paul Swan. It's my real name, too. It's not my stage name. And uh, thanks for joining. I'll be talking to you on Monday. Until then, good night. WRBC Huntington, W227BS Huntington. This is your radio home for Pittsburgh Pirates baseball, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930.